tuatahi i katsukana ngā mihi kia koutou, kua tau mai i raro i te uh, karangau te rā nei. Uh, ko rangi mari i hūnia tōko ingoa, he uri a hau no Ngāti Whātua, i runga i tērā. Uh, katsukana Ngāti Whātua, he mihi mai o hākia koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, katoa. Uh, it's indeed a privilege for Ngāti Whātua to be here today. I stand here as Ring Māori, the individual, but I stand proudly as um, a descendant of the Ngāti Whātua people. And what we are here to talk about today is uh, Tāmaki, the inclusive city. And it's an interesting one because my people have been here for 350 uh, years on the shores of the Waitemata. Uh, we have been based in Orake for many, many years and uh, today we still stand. And it was uh, an interesting time because in 1840, through the, through the courage and what I think leadership, as Shimavel talked about, uh, our ancestor went to Kororareka and invited Governor Hobson to come and settle in Tāmaki Makoto. And when, he, when they, they went to uh, bring Governor Hobson down, they invited Governor Hobson and the administration onto the shores of the Waitemata, onto Okahu Bay. And from that day, we, be we believe that inclusion started, actually. Uh, it's that day that we believe that partnership came to be, and we think that that was the basis of uh, inclusion in this beautiful city of Tāmaki. The other point that I want to make is, uh, for us, for Ngāti Whātua, Tāmaki Makaurau has a right to live its name. Tāmaki Makaurau is not Auckland, the most livable city. Tāmaki Makaurau is translated as Tāmaki, loved by many. It is the most lovable city, and it's everybody's, everybody's role who chooses to live and love in this tribal land to actually into these, into these beautiful lands of Tāmaki to make it so. Uh, we don't think that Tāmaki has got there quite yet, but we think that there is a potential for it to be so. So it's not right from Ngāti Whātua's view that inequality exists. It's not right that poverty uh, is becoming a reality, whether or not you want to call it a crisis or a challenge, a harane. Ellen's already shown you uh, the results and we live it, we see it, we smell it, we breathe it every other day. But what is it that uh, Rangamadia wants to talk about for the next eight minutes, actually? <laughs> and I've got to be pretty cool because I've got my two babies watching and listening to their mother uh, talk about something that's dear to their hearts. I can't get it too wrong. What I want to talk about is how a community takes, takes control of its circumstance. And to me, that is probably the most important uh, element of getting this right. You cannot do something to a community. You must enable a community to take control uh, of its destiny. Now, Te Whātua has had a chequered history. In 1951, we were virtually landless uh, on the shores of Wakahu Bay. And we were left with, after the whole of Tāmaki, within five years we lost uh, most of our tribal lands. So by, by 1845 we were virtually landless. And by 1950, 1951 we had a quarter acre. And that quarter acre was our cemetery. Now this isn't too long ago, because my mother's sitting in the, uh, in the audience and mum was born in 54. So we're not talking about something that's so distant from Rangimadi and it's not so distant from my two children uh, who are sitting there in the back row. But what is interesting is how over two generations that landscape and that narrative can change. Ngāti Whātua was virtually uh, landless. Ngāti Whātua was in poverty. Ngāti Whātua had suffered. However, uh, today we will post a balance sheet of over $900 million in two generations. And what I want to talk about, actually, is taking control of that circumstance in a post-settlement environment. How do we do that? You know, we've got an uncle in Ngāti Whātua and they call his name is uh, Bob Marley. And he says, none but ourselves can free our minds. And I would like to think that we have had some bold and courageous leadership uh, to enable that to occur. So one of the things that we have uh, done, and it was funny, it was uh, Rod who said, Marty, do you think you can talk about this programme that you've been doing? I wasn't talking about it, but I love it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boast about it until uh, the cows come home. <laughs> We have just completed a project and it is called Kainga Tuatahi. So you'll see up there Ngāti Whātua Rākei, Kainga Tuatahi. In Māori the word Kainga means home and Tuatahi means first. And I was on the board of Ngāti Whātua Rākei Whairawa, our economic arm. And what we decided was that we were going to do this 
straight out of post settlement we were going to make a change to the landscape. And what we were going to do is invest our own money, our own energy and our own resource in creating our own future. And that's what we did. In the past we've had about three different developments at Ōrāke. Uh, housing developments, nobody would give us any money. So Housing New Zealand decided, in the house that I live in currently actually, we'll give you some money, uh, we'll give you $125,000 but we'll build your house on stilts because we just can't trust you uh, to pay it back. So when you decide to default, uh, we'll get out a chainsaw, we'll take your house uh, on stilts and uh, off we go. However, what we decided is uh, we're not, we don't want to do that anymore. And we went to the bank and we said to them, we're going to build these homes. They're going to be on Papakaina land. They're going to be collectively, they're on uh, tribally owned land. The people who live in the homes that own those homes will never own the land. That will belong to the people. Will you give us some money? Not one bank in this country refused Ngāti Whātua uh, that money. Which means that we had the ability to do all the design uh, and apply policies that I think have been alluded to today. Here is uh, what our homes look like, and we're, you know, we're pretty stoked about this. We have built 30 homes, uh, 30 brand new homes, cost the Ngāti Whātua 15 million dollars. Uh, we have become the bank. We have uh, allowed 30 families to come and uh, we've been privileged actually uh, to invite 30 families back onto our tribal land. We owned some state houses. There were 10. We um, pulled those down and we replaced them with 30. What you will find in this particular development, they are all tribal descendants, 26 out of 30 are first time homeowners and 10 out of 30 are first generation homeowners. What we'll also see in this is that on the same piece of land that we used to have two bedroom state houses on, we have now gone from uh, 10, like I said, 10 dwellings and about 30 people to 30 dwellings and 150. So we have created a medium density solution to allow not only home ownership but equally to bring people back onto their tribal lands and to connect with their community because it is their ancestral right to be amongst uh, their community and to be loved and to looked after uh, collectively. What we have also done is said that it is inappropriate and it's not on that our children would be going, would be raised in cold, damp and mouldy homes. So we've built our housing policy around our kids and uh, we have absolutely no shame in doing that. So we have made sure uh, that we have got the best materials there to keep our babies, their babies warm. What we do know too is that since we've opened these homes, the number of children who have gone in uh, to, the, to the medical clinics, because we also have GP clinics, the reduction in preventable illnesses around rheumatic fever, around cellulitis and around mouldy, you know, those things that are an incidence of uh, actually mouldy, cold and damp homes has reduced significantly. Uh, what we're also seeing too is that uh, to own homes you must have employment. So we are changing the social indices and landscape around Ngāti Whātua because we have 30 families and 150 people who actually come from homes where employment is the norm. And that is creating a ripple effect in this community that no government policy actually could ever do because the community has decided that that's what it wants. The other beautiful part about this is not just the economics, not just the way that a tribe invests in its uh, people, it's also around culture. What we know in uh, Kainga Tuatahi is that of those homes, at least a half of those homes can speak Māori, which means we have nearly doubled the amount of people in our community who speak Māori as their first language. That's hot uh, in my view of the world as the uh, Chief Executive of our Tribal Development Arm. We're also finding that the, uh, the quality of the home is significant. So we have just won, uh, in terms of the building, we have just won uh, property awards in the New Zealand, uh, New Zealand Property Council. We've also won some architectural awards that have gone offshore. Uh, we have used the absolute best in terms of the materials to ensure that they last longer than 50 years. We've also, we've also uh, inserted what we call a put option because even though I think it's the centre of our universe, the chances are some families may choose to leave. So how do we ensure that they can extract equity and move on to other bigger and brighter things? Other than, I don't know why you would, but uh, some, some families will. And we have uh, provided that, that opportunity there. And finally, in my last 40 seconds, um, 
I just want you to have a look, actually. <laughs> here is uh, one of the homes that we've got here. This is, you'll see that we've also used all of our native, we've got a nursery, uh, and we've got one of the, uh, one of a few, I think, organic nurseries in the city and we have done all of the landscaping work there. We have tried to apply our views to sustainability in the terms of um, what we do in stormwater and how we protect what goes out into the Waitemata. Uh, you'll see all of that has been factored into our design. So it's not just about the inside, it's about the outside as well and how we look after uh, Papatuanuku. Anorera tēnā koutou katoa.